you're not just a number with God. He knows your name. The E Militia Podcast, Episode 48, Anarchist Bible Study with the Marauder Project. Enjoy fuckers. <laughs> All right. Um, hello and welcome to the E Militia Podcast. I'm Bloody Revolutions, or BR, and I'm joined by Miss Buckles, Guns and Guillotines, uh, Rebellious Liberty, and Rezzy. And our special guest today is the Marauder Project. Um, welcome to the show, man. I'm glad, I'm glad we finally managed to set up. Finally, huh? I, I feel like, I don't know if we've been asking you about it, but I feel like we as a group have been discussing having you on for like about 20 to 30 episodes time. So it's for, been implicit. <laughs> for, for me, it's been a long time coming. I don't know if one of us just like last week was like, hey, you want to come on the show? But um, it was planned, I promise. Yeah, that was really good. He asked me. <laughs> okay, good stuff. Someone's organized here, and it's not me, as everyone knows. So, uh, I mean, in our community, you're known for kind of being the, the voice of reason, I'd say, amongst the, uh, the kind of anarchist Christian sort of group. And I, I really love seeing your takes in my feed because it's like, I'll thank fuck consistency on something that so many people, like, they go all the way authoritarian or they, you know, like, they just get the takes so awfully wrong. And to see your kind of opinions, Sean, uh, amongst, you know, Rebs, I'm going to give you some credit, of course. Both of you, I love seeing, um, you know, separating statism from religion. And so that's something I think is, uh, we've been wanting to get into for a long time as a topic, but we never had quite the, uh, the panel for it. I mean, me and Anglo are certainly not um, men of God. So <laughs> just, <laughs> I, I think we'd feel a little bit guilty discussing that with just Rebs. So um, it, it's great to have you on to kind of get into all that. And um, yeah. <laughs> You, uh, how would you describe your, your page and what you do? Well, it, I was telling uh, Rezzy that it started off actually as just entirely as a gun page. So yeah. if you were to go back about three or four years, uh, my page, that's where the name came from. It was something to do a little bit on gun culture. It was my take on gun culture. I had a lot of guns, still have a lot of guns, wanted to <laughs> do some stuff for gun culture. And so the Marauder Project. But and I was back then. I was like more of a stereotypical. I don't know. Guess conservative, uh, definitely heavy right wing. And so, I come from a, a bit of a background of like more right wing authoritarian. And then as I progress, as things have gotten, you know, just in society in general has, and I've <laughs> gotten deeper in my faith. I've just it started off as more of a rejection of of the things that happened, then I realized that there's a deep philosophical, moral, and faith-based principle behind rejecting, um, you know, a human authority claim over the rights of others. And uh, I find that to be very scripturally based, um, faith-based. And so, well, I haven't even gotten into that description yet, but uh, my page is pretty devout um, to the Christian faith. So, Yeah. And, like, like I was saying, like I'm, I've always been very, I, I'd even border on saying militantly atheist. I, I'll never, you know, slap the Bible out of someone's hand, but I just, it's yeah. not part of my life at all. But I, I love and appreciate your posts, like even the the really biblical stuff. I, because I can see the consistency. You know, it's not right. like, it. I think religion always frustrated me, and maybe I speak for other atheist ANCAPs and such, but, like, it's the inconsistency of, like, you know, love one another and care for your neighbor and stuff, and then you're you're advocating for a guy with a gun to go to their house and force them to live your way, and it's like, that's, that always kind of bugged me, so, and I think it's why I had a problem with religion. I think the, the inconsistency and the hip hop, you know, not with religion in general, but with the way that most in society these days think religion works you know is a I... big atheist i have to agree with him and uh, i feel the same way about seeing your post it's refreshing i grew up around a lot of catholics and christians yeah and i seen you know they would preach one thing and act another way yeah and to see that you're actually doing what you preach and so many people like to preach about God and then relate it to authoritarianism 
And from my understanding of most religious texts don't work out like that. No, they like, don't. So here's something, something we're going to have to distinguish in the onset is that religion in general, since ever since religion was first a thing, and including Christianity, has been used to oppress other people. It's been used to increase the power of the state. It's been increased. It's, I mean, just in American history, it was used to justify owning African Americans. So it's kind of what I kind of reconcile it with, what I kind of... Um, Whenever I explain this to people, I explain it to other Christians because this is something that you have to come to terms with. That this is a phenomenon that this, the state has intentionally used it. Other people trying to form states have used it. And just individuals trying to oppress other people in general have used it. That just like anything else, whenever people try to oppress other people, they'll use practically anything. And that is kind of, in many ways, what makes a state so diabolical is it can use a lot of stuff. It, it's great at perverting things. It's great at distorting oh, absolutely. things. So something I liken it to is the idea of freedom. And so a lot of you guys will probably understand this. You take um, the idea of freedom, a state, like especially a nationalist, um, like say, like super, super right-wing nationalist state will say, well, courts protect your private property rights. Police are what defend your person. Militaries fight for your freedom abroad. And so you have to come to terms with these topics are things that the state will easily use to pervert. So just because the state uses that thing like freedom, I think we're all in agreement here. Freedom isn't necessarily like a no-no just because the state uses it to pervert, like perverts it to gain control over other people. I'd say yeah. a, a good, huge portion, and I'm not just talking about religion right now. I hope you guys realize that. Like, I'm talking more this about the state. Like, a huge amount of Americans right now, whether they be Democrats or Republicans, think that their civil liberties are guaranteed by the existence of an oppressive state. Agreed. <laughs> right. Yeah, I, I get what you're getting at as well, because, I mean, there's all sorts of things that will dangle in front of us to legitimize their violence. Like, you know, sure. I mean, just if you start going down the route of, uh, you know, socializing the government and you get like, uh, you know, socialized healthcare, it's like, well, you know, how are we going to look after all the sick people? Like, we got to justify this violence because you like, you know, looking after people's health, right? And it's, I mean, there's so many different ways to justify violence with a, a shiny object, whether it be religion or, you know. Uh, Security. Yeah, yeah. Freedom. I, I, yeah. There's a way to get to everyone, and our state does such an effective job of combining and then bastardizing so many things that should be, you know, they are important, and people misconstrue us as libertarians and anarchists and such as hating because we're against the, the state being in charge of it. And it's like, no, 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 no. We actually love all those things too, and we, we agree they're important. They've just completely abused and neglected them and then twisted to make it look like we're the ones who hate them. Exactly, because there are ideas, there are intangibles that can be. That's the whole point. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's a philosophy, and um, like any philosophy, it can be, like I said, distorted. So, I'd say, and ironically, I've in a lot of my posts, I describe um, just this blind compliance and blind proposal of the state as a false religion. Or, I mean, yeah. not even necessarily false. It is a religion. I mean, by definition, blind yeah. obedience and worship of a state is a religion. Um, it, it's even re referred to in the Bible as a religion. So, Oh, like it, it mentions um, like false... Yes. I, yes. So I can, I can go into that, but first, first Samuel chapter 8, I was mentioning that to Reb earlier, that I wanted to talk about that. But it's the instance, of course... The, you know, the Bible, obviously famous for following the Jewish people. Um, it follows them up to the point in this chapter. It's uh, the first book of Samuel. Samuel was a prophet. And at that time, Israel was basically a leaderless state. It, was, it wasn't a free state because it still had a government structure. But it wasn't really governed by man. It was said to have been governed by God. 
And so you have a prophet, and he basically kind of loosely organizes Israel. And Israel was a nomadic group of people. And then eventually Israel decided to settle down, and they demanded of their prophet Samuel that God appoint them a king. And so they weren't electing a king for themselves or anything like that. But they asked Samuel to intervene with God for them, to appoint them a king like all the other nations so that they could have a person to represent them to all the other tribes of the area, the Philistines, the the Canaanites and whatnot. And so um, Samuel was troubled by that and he went to God. And basically what you have in scripture is God saying, this is just like they've always done. They're worshiping a false idol. They haven't rejected you as a leader. They've rejected me as their king, essentially. So, Yeah. Well, I mean, that cuts pretty deep instantly. I mean, just yeah. saying, like, um, people will accept false leadership, essentially, I guess, right? Yeah. Ex- and not only that, uh, well, I mean, you know that you guys know that the Bible, that people use the Bible, like, especially the the guys who are like on the fascist end of the spectrum i see oh, that yeah. so much i try to call that out as much as i can oh and i, I love you very much for it <laughs> every time i see it i'm like oh yeah. <laughs> that i i just i cannot bear the misquoting of scripture that is just something that really irks me so i'm going to read to you guys i know i know you guys are atheists so or oh, some no. of you guys I are mean, atheists. I, we're, we're discussing theocracy and how it, you know, how it um, behaves around the state. So go, go nuts, man. Okay. <laughs> so just bear, I think some of you guys might have an eye opening for this. And I, at the very least, whenever the fascists start to talk about this sort of thing, you can bring this up. <laughs> so it is, we have here in Samuel chapter 8. And it says, when Samuel grew old, he appointed his sons as ju- judges over Israel. So here we have this very loose, kind of. Not, it's not a legislative structure of government. It's a judicial structure of government. Basically, the people would live their own lives according to the Levitical law of God. So earlier in the Bible, God gives a um, sort of a stringent uh, moral-based system of governance for Israel. And this is what we call in scripture as the old law. And so you guys probably know this very well. It's like gay people get stoned. Um, Adulteresses and adulterers get stoned. You get a tattoo, you get stoned. Exactly, exactly. So this is the old law. And so the people were to live their lives by that. And then the form of judgment at that time was through the judicial system. So you have Samuel here. He's a prophet, and he appoints his sons as judges over Israel. His firstborns, and I'm reading right now word for word, his firstborn son's name was Joel, and his second was Abijah. And so it goes on to say, however, his sons did not walk in his ways. They turned toward dishonest gain, took bribes, and perverted justice. Ironically, like <laughs> uh, the very first judicial you know, system that was meant to govern Israel, even though God appointed them, just immediately kind of turns to trash. And so all the (laughs) elders of Israel gathered together and went to Samuel, and they said to him, Look, you are old, and your sons do not follow your example. Therefore appoint to us a king to judge us the same as all the other nations have. And when they said, Give us a king to judge us, Samuel considered their demand sinful. So he prayed to the Lord. But the Lord told him, Listen to the people and everything they say to you. They have not rejected you. They have rejected me as their king. They are doing the same thing to you that they have done to me since until the day I brought them out of Egypt, abandoning me and worshiping other gods. Listen to me. I'm sorry, listen to them. But you must solemnly warn them and tell them about the rights of the king who will rule over them. And so he goes on. God tells um, Samuel the rights of a king. But you should probably keep in mind what the the sentence beforehand, listen to them, but you must solemnly warn them and tell them about the rights of the king who will rule over them. So he goes on to, to, to talk about it. It's like a good paragraph long, but as you start off at the top, you get a very general view of any government structure. So it says, these are the rights of the king who will rule over you. He will take your sons and put them to his use in his chariots or his horses 
or running in front of their, his chariots. He can appoint them to use his commanders of thousands or commanders of fifties to plow the, his ground or reap his harvest. So he's talking about conscripted service right here, talking mm-hmm. about it in his military um, and gad- agricultural labor. And so, I mean, that's, you know, government employee, government conscription and warfare. That's very basic. We see it across the board from the beginning of time until now. That's very characteristic of authority. And so it goes on to say, he can take your daughters to become perfumers, cooks, bakers, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. He can take a tenth of your grain and your vineyards and give them to his officials and servants. He can take your male servants, your female servants, your best young men. He can take a tenth of your flocks and you yourselves can become his servants. And in other translations, like in the King James Version, which I was describing, uh, I think it was before the podcast began. The King James Version was a very was like the very first translation. I believe that's correct. The very first translation from the old text into a more English text. And so in that old, and they, they cut right to the chase. And in the King James Version, it just says slaves. Mm. Instead of servants, you will become his slaves. So again, it's talked about conscriptive service. It's talking about taxes. He's going to take a, a tenth of your flocks, a tenth of your produce. And then it says, again, and you yourselves can become his slaves or his servants. When that day comes, you will cry out because of the king you've chosen for yourselves, but the Lord won't answer you on that day. And then it goes on to say, the people refused to listen to Samuel. No, they said, we must have a king over us. <laughs> <laughs> That's the entire reason I, I see so, many, so much consistency amongst um, you, know, you guys who, who are still believers and also <laughs> anti-government. I mean, uh, that cuts right to it. Yeah. Right from the get-go, calling it false. Yeah. But now there are some caveats with that. I mean, there are um, portions of the Bible that say, effectively, you cannot rebel against the government. Like, you cannot use violent revolution against the government because that's not becoming Mm. of a Christian. So, but that's in, I told Reb I wanted to talk about that. That's Romans 13. And so, you will constantly see guys, uh, like on the the far right wing, of the political spectrum using that to justify their, uh, their beliefs. And so I'm trying to pull that up right now. And you guys have probably heard that. Or if you've seen my posts, you might've seen it, me talking about it. Or if you've seen the comment section of my posts, especially when I go after the far right, they literally swarm there. They like uh, mm. one of my, one of my posts that I kind of targeted them. Uh, it had like, 300 or so one of those comment spreads or <laughs> belief beneath it so it was pretty oh crazy and it's just what about romans 13 what about you know all all of that but so for romans 13 it says literally this is and if you guys want to discuss that last one before i go into romans 13 do you guys want to I mean, we, we, can, we can circle back you're on a roll okay sounds good so, something that they quote, and this is, they usually take, go, hop right into this chapter. And so, whenever that happens, it really irks me because you almost <laughs> never get a context of what is actually going on in the entire book. So, for people who might be listening to this and might not know exactly the composition of the Bible, the Bible doesn't read like in a straight line from cover to cover. The Bible is made up of a bunch of individual books. And so some of them are written thousands of years apart. And they're not, they're just not pieced together very well. And so a good understanding, I've, I've read the Bible cover to cover four times, and I'm just barely getting a glimpse of it now. <laughs> so um, it's like a Tarantino film. It really, it really is. You, un- you start to understand more and more as you go into it, and it takes a lot of, of contemplation, a lot of meditation. So guys who would just take individual scriptures, individual chapters, and quote them without any sort of context, like, dude, I don't think oh, you people understand. Love that. They, they sure do. And I, I'm like, dude, I don't think you even understand the message of, the book, of like, that letter. A lot of these, like what I'm about to read to you right now, is a letter. It's written, it's called an epistle. It's the Apostle Paul writing an epistle to 
which is just a faith-based letter to the Christians living in Rome after the death of Christ. And so a lot of guys have no idea what this letter is even about. And so I just, you know, it's, it's kind of hard for me to take guys like that seriously. And so many of them are, like, like I said, on the right, far right side of the spectrum. But they use this to justify it. So I'll go ahead and I'll read you the verse, and then I'll tell you the context, and then I'll let you <laughs> make up your mind. <laughs> and I, this kind of, actually, I know you guys like uh, agorism, agorism a lot, and this... This whole message of this section really ties in well with that. Um, it's not something to understand about the Christian faith is that if you follow it strictly to the letter, you end up with a form of, say, like complete liberty, something like an anarchy. But it's not a political base. Yeah. It's Christian, the Christian faith, and I'm not, I don't even like to call it Christianity because that's just kind of like, Whenever you talk about Christianity, it's just one of those isms. It's just an, one of those entities. Like a lot of people don't even like who call themselves Christians don't even know what that means. Someone who follows the words of Christ would inevitably end up at where I just said, but not well, from a political stance. Well, the NAP is basically the golden rule. The NAP is almost just like the golden rule. The only difference is that one is in affirmation of how you should behave and one is a distinguishment of how you shouldn't behave the nap being how you shouldn't behave and the golden rule being how you should behave so i i put the positive before the negative so the, the positive just being the golden rule with it being um treat one another as you would have them treat you right and then the nap is never treat anybody aggressively. So there's the positive and then there's the negative. And they go hand in hand. They work, I mean, you could literally, theoretically, there's a person who's like a sadist out there <laughs> who following the golden rule can, can hurt someone. But like anyone in their right mind wants to be treated well. So the NAP and the golden rule do go hand in hand. You're correct. And I, I think as an atheist, like I went through a phase like, I didn't like any religion mm -hmm. because I had met so many religious people and everything I've been taught about it was, you know, it's the golden rule and none of them followed it. And exactly. it turns out yeah. I don't hate religious people. I just hate hypocrites. Yeah. 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 Go. <laughs> Nailed it. Right I, I don't know if you've guys seen the page, the Rogan comp. He's like one yes. of the gun guys on Instagram he is an agnostic, but he, said, he uh, says that he lives by Christian moral philosophy. So, like, although he doesn't believe in God personally, he sees great merit in the Christian morals, which I think is awesome. I think that's great. So, I've heard a couple people say things like that, to that effect. Like, if you don't believe in, you know, a higher power like that, at least live your life the way you do, because it's not going to hurt anybody. Yeah, I, I mean, it couldn't hurt. Now, I mean... Uh, I think that it kind of, if you don't believe in it, no offense to you guys, it kind of boil up, boils down to nihilism just from a philosophical perspective. But, I mean, there's, I don't have any issue with that. But <laughs> I, I don't have an issue with being called a nihilist. <laughs> <laughs> I, I mean, that's just like a personal <laughs> no, observation. That's, that's if, fine, if yeah. It's all dark and stuff at the end. Oh, well, maybe, maybe we leave the it's dark at the end conversation for the end. <laughs> <laughs> maybe, but maybe. So, maybe. <laughs> sorry, I'll circle back around to the uh, Romans 13 talk. So this is constantly used. And so I could honestly go to my Instagram and just look, scroll down through one of my posts and you'll see those, you know, those guys who are like literally fascists. I'm not like calling them fascists because of some like progressive leaning they're literally <laughs> fasc fascist they claim oh, yeah, they're fascists that. they're out and proud yeah um so they will sit there and cite romans 13 all day so romans 13 says very Doesn't first thin blue line do that a lot yes constantly it's okay. like a very big police thing it's a big politician thing you'll see politicians cite it um a lot of those republican bible belt guys will cite it so, it's, so it's, it's one of them little things. It's one little sentence. 
Well, it's Man. actually it's it's a a part of a chapter, yeah, but it's taken out. All right, well, keep going. Okay, so it's the chap the chapter's titled "A Christian's Duties to the State," and it says everyone must submit to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except from God, and those that exist are instituted by God. So then, the one who resists the authority is opposing God's command. And those who oppose it will bring judgment on themselves. For rulers are not a terror to good conduct, but to bad. Do you want to be unafraid of authority? Do what is good, and you will have its approval. For government is God's servant for your good. But if you do wrong, be afraid, because it does not carry the sword for no reason. For government is God's servant, an avenger that brings wrath on the one who does wrong. Therefore, you must submit not only because of the wrath, but also because of your conscience. And for this reason you pay taxes, since the authorities are God's public servants, continually attending to these tasks. Pay your obligations to everyone, taxes to those who owe taxes, tolls to those who owe tolls, respect to those who owe respect, and honor to those who owe honor. So, almost condemning entirely of uh, the whole liberty movement, correct? (laughs) <laughs> oh yeah, we we're uh, we're right, evil bastards now. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so the shame. Give, uh, yeah, exactly. We're just you know, anarchy, <clears throat> liberty. You must just want chaos, buddy. Well, I haven't heard that one before. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so, um, a little background to Roman. So uh, there had been an event after the death of Christ where. It was a Jewish feast, and Jews from all over the uh, kind of the Mediterranean area, that Asia Minor area, Asia Minor area, came to Jerusalem, which was the site where Christ was crucified. And so they came to do this Jewish celebration. Some were from Rome, some were from Greece, some were from other areas throughout Israel. So they came. And the apostles, the devout followers of Christ, preached his word to them in the streets and, according to scripture, converted thousands. So, a lot of people like to claim like bullshit on this because it's not like necessarily historically documented. But the fact remains is that Christianity, right, out, right behind the historical death of Christ, exploded into Asia Minor. So, you have people from Rome who were factually, historically Christian, right after the death of Christ, right after 32 AD. You have guys in Greece and all all over the uh, Mediterranean area who were Christians. So that fact remains. Paul himself had been what was called a Pharisee. And a Pharisee is a caste of Jew who were somewhat of a preacher, but more of a legal authority. And he hated Christians at the time, and he sought to persecute them as much as possible, putting them to death, um, exposing them to the state. He was, I mean, quite literally like a police commander of sorts. And so on a road to one of his excursions, he was, uh, according to Scripture, caught by God, blinded, and sent to the Christians um, a certain Christian ambassador who converted Paul, restored his sight, and then Paul became, his name beforehand was Saul. He took on the name Paul afterwards. Paul is a historical figure. He was killed by the Romans. He was a Roman citizen. Um, And much of the mission work of Christianity at that point came from Paul. I'd, I'd suffice to say Christianity at, to this day would not be anywhere near where it was without Paul. The Romans, the book, the letter to the Romans was based on Romans, or based on Christians who had come to that festival right after Christ's death, become Christians, gone back to Rome, and then the emperor Nero took power. And Nero hated Christians. He hated them so much. Also, I don't know if you guys knew this from a historical standpoint, but Nero was literally insane. Um, <laughs> it's, he's where the uh, saying, 
the fiddling at the burning of Rome came from. It was the rumor came from that he set or had Rome set on fire and then played a fiddle at the palace while Rome was burning. <laughs> Anyways, that's a, that's a side note. But uh, Nero hated Christians and he used the burning of Rome as an excuse to incite public hatred against Christians. They were seen as rebels. They were seen as, because the, the faith of Rome at that time was the, you know, the Roman interpretation of the Greek, um, what's it called, polypathus or polytheus or whatever, I can't remember the name of it, but the, the big group of Greek gods turned Roman. You have Jupiter, you have yeah. Zeus, and whatnot. But, so they were viewed as, as rebels. And they were begging the, the Christian leaders at the time who were living in Jerusalem for guidance. They said, these pagans are slaughtering us. They take us to the Colosseums and burn us at the stake. They put us in front of bulls and have us ripped to shreds. What do we do? Do we resist? Do we overthrow? And then you get this letter from Paul. And so Paul wrote this letter to them, trying to console them on what to do. So whenever you read Romans 13, you have to come into it with the mind that these Christians are being slaughtered. The Christians that he's talking to are being killed by the state he's talking about. And he's aware of that. So right before, literally the chapter before this in Romans 12, Paul is discussing the marks of a Christian. And so it says, Love must be without hypocrisy. Detest evil, cling to what is good. Show family affection to one another with brotherly love. Outdo one another in showing honor. Do not lack uh, diligence. Be fervent in the spirit. Serve the Lord. Rejoice in hope. Um, Be patient in affliction. Be persistent in prayer. Share with the saints in their needs. Pursue hospitality. They referred to each other as saints at that time. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse. Rejoice with those who weep. Um, I'm sorry. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Weep with those who weep. Be in agreement with one another. Do not be proud. Instead, associate with the humble. Do not be wise in your own estimation. Do not repay anyone evil for evil. Try to do what is honorable in everyone's eyes. Um, If possible, on your part, live at peace with everyone. Friends, do not avenge yourselves. Instead, leave room for his, capital H, wrath. For it is written, Vengeance belongs to me, I will repay, says the Lord. But if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him something to drink. For in doing so, you will will be heaping fiery coals on his head. Mm -hmm. Then, if you remember, he says, um, Do not avenge yourself. Vengeance belongs to me, I will repay. And then you see in the next chapter Romans 13 that they continuously cite government is described as the vengeful agent. Hmm. While also, so the, that's an odd marriage of information. So, so he's talking about, um, you know, loving your oppressor and I, so these are actual letters. These are legitimate letters. Yes. Okay, so you got to look at look at it through that. Like, he right? Knows these aren't just be... these aren't just someone had an idea. Like, like the the prevailing a lot of Christians think that the books that you read in the Bible are just someone sat down, had words from God in their head, and wrote it down. That's not true. The Christian faith, like the real Christian faith, not just this amorphous religion that bubbles out of churches. The real Christian faith speaks to divine inspiration of, Christ, of, of Scripture, which means God works through your words and the events that happen to you to reveal his will in the Scripture that you read. It does not talk about divine transcription, which is someone starts writing down the literal word of God just randomly into a book. That's, that's not what it means. These are like actual Scripture, or I'm sorry, actual letters that church leaders sent to one another and the word of God is revealed through them. Well, just that fact alone, like, makes you think about 
listen to it, listen to people regurgitate Romans 13 over and over again, totally different. Yes, it is. It's it, a lot of people don't realize this is it's referencing a very specific time and a very specific uh, sort of events that were happening to Christians. Now, I do think it's applicable. applicable. Well, and, it's a letter written by a human during um, we can all relate to what's going on now. Like if you yes. wrote a letter six months ago about an event that was happening and what you thought was going to happen, would it be the same as what you're writing now? Uh, Pro- yeah, absolutely. Not. <laughs> yeah, you know what I'm saying? Like when when the riots first started happening in Minnesota, could you have predicted what was going to happen here? Are there things you would go back and be like? No, I would have acted a little differently or said, you know, like had a different opinion now that time has gone past. So this guy's literally writing a letter being like, right now, this is how I feel. Like, do this, just obey because, you know, you'll die if you don't. Right. I mean, that that is essentially what he's saying. There is a message to it that withstands the passage of time. Um, that being the the part on vengeance. And so, uh, he, like, he describes government as, I mean, and we all know this, this isn't just Christian philosophy, right? We all know that the legitimizer to the state is violence. It's, it, and not just violence. It's violence committed against innocent people to do its own will, right? And so, that, what Paul was saying in this is, like, the reason that these things happen is like he says, uh, what is it? Therefore submit not only because of the wrath, but also because of your conscience. And he says that the state does not, or the emperor does not wield the sword for no reason. Like there is a specific reason that it's doing this. There are people who it targets. He's not turning a blind eye to the fact that Christians are being slaughtered by the thousand. Right. And He's saying the actions that it's doing, like, those same actions are not becoming of you as a Christian. You cannot do those, and you can't advocate for those. So while you can't submit, or while you must not be a rebel, like an active, and if you see on my page, I literally call myself a rebel. That's a, like completely what Paul is referring to him to a rebel in this is completely different than what you and I might consider a rebel. What he's saying is what the Christians were thinking at the time is let's go kill all these pagan Romans out of our vengeance. Mm. We can't do that. Like, not, I'm a Christian, I can't do that. You guys can't do that. That violates NAP, that violates the golden rule. It's, it's literally saying, like, these actions of a government, you cannot adopt them. So although you can, like, you're not to violently rebel against it, you're also not to advocate for the things that it does. Yeah. And also a, a good point that something that really puts this into perspective is that word establish and institutes, where Paul talks about how God establishes authority and how he institutes rulers. That's just one translation of this verse. The original translation of this verse comes from, like I said earlier, King James. That word originally was ordain, not establish. Ordain means to make a minister or a priest. So it's not saying, like, whenever you... It, it, and it refers to this in the Old Testament as well, not just in the New Testament. Pagan leaders would be ordained as God's servants to, to enact a sort of, of message or to remind the Jews of something. It's not that they actually have any mindfulness to God, that these pagans, uh, these rulers, actually intend to do God's will. Nero, he really did want to kill Christians. So whenever he was ordained by God, it doesn't mean he somehow had God's will in mind. It speaks to God's ability to use calamity, horrors that already exist to to the exaltation of his will. So, for example, whenever Nero was in king, or what, I'm sorry, whenever Nero was a king, he was Caesar, was 
the time in Christianity, Christianity's early days when it took off the most. Under the horrible, horrible persecution of Nero, Christianity, despite all rhyme or reason why people would want to avoid a faith that gets heavily persecuted, it became massive up to the point where it eventually, uh, the Caesars realized that it was such a powerful religion, such a powerful faith that they, in order to take on its power, they made it the state religion of Rome. Paul was saying, telling the Christians that they were to reject the government, but they were calling for death. And Paul was saying, no, as a Christian, you can't do that. And I saw a lot of similarities with like the Boogaloo movement of today, where people are like screaming, yeah, kill everyone. But at the same time, like, no, no, there's people going, we can't incite violence. We're against violence. Remember that. Like, you're allowed to protect yourself, but to call for blood is not the society we want to live in. Right. And so my point earlier about agorism is, I mean, I learned about this from you guys, from listening to you guys, um, listening to you guys speak on this. Um, And so... Obviously, it's like counter economics, finding ways out of like paying taxes. It's uh, trying to subvert quietly in a nonviolent way because, I mean, we all know like a violent revolution of sorts, like it, it kind of just, you know, erects tyranny in the place of other tyranny. Yeah. And we see that constantly. Sorry, go ahead. Oh, it's, it's like that consistency. It, I, like just how you were describing. Um, just from a historical perspective, the way Christianity kind of started, and it was this um, antithesis to the, you know, the, the harshness of the Romans and stuff. It's kind of the the same thing today, where it's like um, consistency in libertarianism is more about um, actually following through on your values, not just establishing what you'd like to see in society. Which is kind of why I got from, um, you know, uh, that that what was it, a epistle. Yeah, this is an epistle. Yeah, epistle from Paul, because um, he's advocating for consistency, just as you know, agorism would, where it's um, you know, like any any kind of solution that either requires you know um, advocating for state violence via winning, yeah, you know, quote unquote, winning through voting or a violent revolution are both inconsistent with libertarian values. It's like you're using a tool that's not in our toolbox morally to achieve what we want which is it kind of defeats the whole point of it and so i i get what you're getting at with um you know saying how it it kind of makes you think of agorism the way they uh, the way he was advocating to not use their own harsh methods against their oppressors because it's like then you just become them and the cycle continues yes and also but it's also important to distinguish this like the the rhetoric that he was using like i draw the similarities between his what Paul would say, and a form of agorism. But the reality is, is it's like, while they sound the same, they're also completely different. Because again, <laughs> the Christian faith has nothing to do with politics. Like, the yeah. Christian faith rejects politics. So, while, you know, like, agorism, I guess you guys would say, like, wouldn't you say agorism is politically oriented? Would you say that? There has mm. a political objective in mind, which is a lack of policy. You want to end the policy. That's, ooh, that's a hard one. Mm. And, like, I, I think either way you go with that, you're going to piss off one camp. <laughs> but, um, well, I no, mean, no, I know I, I, because I, I know anarchy, we like, we oh, reject, God. we reject we, politics, right? Y- yeah, yeah. So, yeah, I, I guess but, it's like wishing for the end of, it, it's, it's a means to get to the end of, people legislating their violence over right, right, right. and so yeah i, I guess but i mean like yeah falling in that realm politics yeah right but falling in that realm like christianity it's just like that's not even a consideration its purpose the christianity of the time it was a revolution but its purpose wasn't to dismantle the state yeah. its purpose was to establish the kingdom of heaven and so um whenever we look at this stuff that says like submit to the government or submit to the emperor, pay your taxes, you got to understand 
this this thing it's like at the same time also here here let me put it in this way christians were being slaughtered christians were breaking the law paul was inevitably the man who wrote that who said submit to your government um uh, pay your taxes he was inevitably thrown into prison by the roman empire because they considered him a rebel and he was martyred he was slaughtered by the roman empire for his faith because in the end the christian faith doesn't allow you to submit like the way he's talking about submittance to a to an authority is kind of completely different than he's talking about what is becoming of a christian is a nonviolent um non-aggressive way of lifestyle and so for example here in i'm reading from first peter's chapter 2 it it talks about the exact intentions behind these men and so peter was a different church leader he and paul were good buddies but they traveled separately and they ministered to different people but they wrote back and forth um this is a letter from first peter or i'm sorry this is a letter from peter it's one of the two letters that we have in the bible and it says um the beginning of this portion of the chapter is called a call to good works and it says dear friends i urge you as strangers and temporary residents to abstain from fleshly desires that war against you conduct yourselves honorably among the gentiles gentiles just means non-jewish pagans so that in case where you speak against, where they speak against you as those d- who do what is evil they will by observing your good works glorify god on the day of visitation submit to every human authority because of the lord whether to the emperor as the supreme authority or to the governors as those out of uh, i'm sorry as those sent out by him to punish those who do what is evil and to praise those who do what is good for it is God's will that you silence the ignorance of foolish people by do- doing good. So he's literally saying, like, submit to the emperor, but not because of the emperor. You submit to, it, it, these Christians were called to submit because if they rebelled, it just defeats the whole Christian movement at the time. The Christian movement at the time was, show these people the love of God. Show these people that we're better than the pagans to be a christian is to is better than to slaughter all of your enemies uh, without discrimination being a christian is a higher calling than these things and you to be a rebel the kind of rebel that they were talking about is to reject these things the jews did have a cast of rebels they're called the the zealots philip um he's one of the apostles he was an ex-zealot he was one of the Jews who violently opposed Rome, and he eventually cast back that history of himself and allowed himself to be martyred by the Roman Empire. Um, now, I'm not saying this is necessarily what you or what I or anybody nowadays is called to do, but this is something that has to be understood about like early Christianity. And whenever people are citing these things as an attempt to you know, justify their view on politics, and it also goes back to like Christ when he was on the earth. And it, I think specifically of when he is asked by the Pharisees if it's lawful to pay tribute to Caesar or not. Um, people take that as him taking a political stand when his entire mission on this earth was not, it, it transcends politics, like you're saying. Yes. And so it's, it's not him taking a political stand in any way. And if he had taken a political stand, it would defeat the very purpose of what he is, his mission, his calling was to do on earth. And so I think people look at that, you know, as, hey, well, Christ made this kind of not really stand. If, you know, if it really was bad, he would definitely say, you know, it's not lawful or something. But then he'd become a political martyr, you know? Yeah. So that's actually... Exactly right. I'm assuming you're referring to the render unto Caesar verse where you yes. talk about taxation. Yes. Well, even, yes. even later when Peter is asked by a tax collector, hey, does your master pay taxes? And then Peter's like, well, yeah. And then Christ is like, good job. Now if I don't, you know, he's going to get offended. So now I have to, you know. And so. Yeah. But so yeah. like that's honestly exactly like God. It, 
pe- people who who quote these things so horribly they just fail to understand that God is God and he really doesn't give two shits about human authority. Yeah. Just to think that God submits himself below, you know, human politics is kind of like, it's so, a self-defeating purpose, like you said. But um, for the render under Caesar thing, you, you got that spot on. In fact, a lot of guys make the claim that Jesus was calling for people to pay taxes, which is, kind of defeats the point <laughs> like he he was the whole situation was that the the pharisees were trying to trick him they to said executed yeah <laughs> like, they, they were trying to trick him they said um you are a minister of god you know what is good tell us is it good to pay taxes to caesar or is it good uh to not pay taxes to caesar so the jews at the time they were being ruled by the romans they didn't want to pay taxes to caesar and so if Jesus said, God said, as a minister, I know God says, pay your taxes, he would have really ticked off the Jews. If he said, God says, don't pay your taxes, well, then he's making a political stance against the Romans, and he's going to get executed by the Romans. Their whole point was, their attempt was to try to trick him into falling into one of those two traps. And the point that they were surprised by it afterwards kind of implies that he was going with neither of those two options. Instead, whenever he said, render under Caesar what is Caesar's and render to God what is God's, he's making right then and there that specific distinction. Rendering unto Caesar is not rendering to God. Giving to Caesar isn't giving to God. These are two completely different topics. And God's will doesn't say to or to not pay taxes. That's got nothing to do with God's will. So, like, you know, guys completely misquote that all the time. Like, you make, you make one Christian-oriented post about not paying taxes, like prop- how God bestows on you, like, the right of self-governance, and with that comes property rights. Guys will come and say, well, Christ said to pay your taxes. That's not what Christ said at all. Yeah. Well, the way I hear it is render unto him what is owed to him. He's owed a big pile of shit in his fucking driveway, then that's what he gets. I mean, you could <laughs> make that argument because ultimately Christ was killed for disobeying Caesar. So, I mean, Christ called himself God, and at the time, Caesar was known to be, you know, the Romans viewed their emperors as living sons of God. So, mm-hmm. Jesus' claim to be the Son of God was a direct conflict well, with like, Caesar's claim. A- after Blasphemy the way you, to the state after- religion. After mm-hmm. the way you explained it, I can't believe they weren't pissed at his answer to begin with. Oh, render uh, to Caesar what is Caesar's and render to God what is God's. I believe like, if I was Caesar, look- right away I'd be like, man, this dude's going to shit my driveway. It's <laughs> 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 like if you go like straight into Mosaic law, it, it goes way deep into like, um, you know, you're. You, you, uh, legally speaking, I can't remember exactly how it all goes, but basically every Jew, every Pharisee knew that God owned everything. Like, you know, er- the earth is God's. And so if mm-hmm. you render yes. to God what is God's and what is unto Caesar Caesar's, there's nothing left for Caesar to take, you know? And so I think that is another way. Yeah, no, for Which, sure. And, I mean, I don't know if you guys have heard of uh, the podcast Anarcho Christian. You probably not, yeah. but oh yeah, yeah. No, I've, I've, okay. I've heard of him. And I follow his, like I follow his Instagram page. I yeah. like him a lot. He's yeah, a it, was, it was a flip of the coin topics. between asking you and him on here. So Stephen Rose is an incredible fellow. He does a great. He has a great message, and um, in fact, uh, on a point of the the old law, like you were talking about, he actually did a great episode on old law. And so the the message that he gave in that episode was who's qualified to kill, and he's talking about like capital punishment using the state, to, which inevitably all state laws boil down to capital punishment. I think we're all aware of that. Like, you don't pay yeah. your taxes, someone's going to be sent to your house, to, and if you resist, they kill you. Every law ultimately is founded at least on the notion of capital punishment. So his point was um, under Christianity, who's qualified to kill? Like, who's qualified to pull that switch to kill? Um, like, and that's not, he makes this specific distinction. 
there's a there's a difference between self defense and the killing that he's talking about. Like he's talking about the form of punishment of the state, and he talks about the old law. And he says in the old law, like when you go back to Levitical Mosaic law, it talks about these are these are the abhorrent sins, like the sins I talked about earlier. If you're gay, if you have tattoos, if you're an adulterer or an adulteress, you get killed. And it's the community's responsibility to kill you. And the judge is the one who sentences you to death. That's the old law. Then there's the new law in Christianity, which comes through Jesus Christ. And this is going to surprise you. The sins that are deserving of death under the new law are every sin. Everybody's sin is deserving of death. But no one, not a single person, is qualified to punish. Well, that's a that's a heavy message right there. Mm-hmm. So where do you go from that? <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, it kind of casts away the idea that of a Christian based state, doesn't it? Yeah. I mean, it's literally a direct, you know, a, a direct contradiction of itself. Yeah, I, I guess when the uh, when the fascists go on about like you know their um their moral laws and all that and their their big state to make sure the degenerates stay in line and, you know, everyone has the nuclear 2.5 family and all that stuff. Um, <laughs> they're also saying we're good enough to be God's execution. Yeah, they yeah, sure are. here to be <laughs> judges, you know, the judges yeah. of Israel. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I mean, th- th- that's just, that's saying you have a direct line with God or something and you're, you're flying in the face. <laughs> him being all powerful and having the last say, you're saying, no, 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 we're good enough to do that. Yeah, I mean, it's it's we a rejection of Christ. <laughs> it, it it is a rejection of Christ because the whole yeah. point of uh, in the new law, Christ Christ's death is everybody is everybody is deserving of sin. If without me, like there is no heaven. But everybody everybody's sin is deserving of death, and I uh, we all know that no one here is perfect, like. But uh, the whole point of Christ's death is that you don't have to die. Like, you don't have to be <laughs> without God in the end, because although you're, everybody's deserving of, of death, and all a God that creates out of love is, is, you know, is willing to take on that burden to relinquish you of the punishment of death. So whenever you're saying, you know, I have the authority to punish these sins that are deserving of death, you're there, they're rejecting the Christ's death. I, I feel like um, a lot of those types as well, they, like we were saying earlier, they, they're very good at picking the few lines that justify their violence, but they're never the context, and it's never the, uh, never the morality or how consistent it is. It's just like, no, 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 he said I could do this. You know? And then that's, that's where it ends. <laughs> and and yet of. they... They, they justify, like, an entire philosophy off a few lines out of context. Mm-hmm. It's just weird, because most <laughs> of the time when I argue with them, they'll, like, kind of gloss over anything that's biblical and move to just, just straight, like, the Middle Ages and during the Crusades, and they're like, see, like, this is what Christianity was for <laughs> yeah. thousands, hundreds of thousands of years Our until... It's already been misconstrued. Until, until like, the 18th yeah. century talk said it was all about love and peace and stuff. And I'm like, what? <laughs> yep. <laughs> so a lot of them are um, they're traditional Orthodox or Catholics. Um, I have nothing against either of those sects, um, but the reality is is that a lot of, and I mean, you can ask them, you can ask these, these fascists like, who are of those two types of faith, they will, like I literally, I don't know if you guys have ever seen or talked to on Instagram. I think they're probably in a lot of you guys' comments section. <laughs> Not mine oh. anymore. No. <laughs> uh, but That's I mean, how that damn loser's only hobby is to, to follow every, like, every libertarian page and then just comment. Just yeah. get ripple. So, like, I mean, I'm not going to talk bad about him or anything, but he, he told me, like, my view of Christianity is and I, when I say my, I'm talking in his perspective. Is based on the teachings of uh, of historical Christian leaders, not scripture. 
he like I, I had a uh, I was having a conversation with him about this, and like I try to I try to, in the best way that I can, you know, appeal to guys who are on that side because they claim to be Christian, and I want them to be at least. I don't care if they necessarily change their political view. I don't give a shit about their politics. I want them to be better people. I want them to be yeah. more righteous, moral people. So I tried to appeal yeah. to them. And he told me, like, well, his, his worldview when it comes to this sort of thing is based more on, on, you know, the teachings of Christian historical leaders, not necessarily scripture at all. Yeah, and yeah. At, at that point, it's like, well, I guess it's a, a political thing than any kind of religious thing. It's like, yeah, yes, the, it is. You, you're following the teachings of people who happen to be religious, but it's not, you know, if consider yourself a christian it's not really the word the of God philosophies anymore. of man mingled with scripture yeah, yep. it's yep. no different than like the vatican or the sanhedrin like or yeah, the pharisees that were you know trying to kill jesus well the same people <laughs> tell you that uh trump was picked by god oh, oh president of the united states yeah emperor daddy it's, it's true it's a emperor daddy it's weird because it's gone like full circle where yeah kings back in the day they were chosen by God, apparently. And then now... That's actually... Romans 13 is where the idea of divine right to rule came mm -hmm. from. And a, you know, it was, came from a fundamental misunderstanding of exactly what that scripture meant. The whole issue between what is ordained and what is appointed yeah. by God. Like, yep, you like can, if you can get a priest to ordain you... And say, hey, see, look, he's ordained a king. And all of a sudden that means that everything he does is of God, you know? Yeah. Exactly. He, he's got a direct line to God. I swear like, he is. Uh, like I said earlier, in the Old Testament, it talks quite a bit about how Egyptians, Philistines, their, their leaders were ordained by ne King Nebuchadnezzar. He's a, a big example of this. He was ordained by God as, as God's servant to teach the Jews a lesson. And yeah, I mean, you could have a literal view of that or a non-literal view of that, but does that mean that anything that King Nebuchadnezzar, like, he enslaved and killed countless people as during his rule of the, the Babylonian Empire? Or I'm sorry, uh, was it Assyrian Empire? I can't remember which. But during his rule, he did horrendous things. Does that mean God, like this, like, in the Christian theology, we hold that God is an all-loving, creating being, does that mean that he backs the intentions of that guy? <laughs> Obviously not. Like it's not, <laughs> there's no consistency in that at all. The the idea of ordination, like I talked about earlier, like whenever they it was referred to in scripture, divine ordination, it refers to this person as not in themselves becoming a priest, because that's what ordained means to become a priest or to become a minister. It means that they become a minister to God's will in consequence, despite what they're doing, not because of what they're doing. It's, it's the same way that a storm can come through and God can ordain a storm to do his will and have, like build communities back up together to be uh, a, you know, a more connected community after a tremendous calamity. Not necessarily that God established or sent the storm itself, just that he's able to use bad things to a good purpose. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the, not that, that he war intended the war. Yeah, yeah. Oh, when we when we see justification of war as <laughs> wait, where are you going with this one? Well, yes, yeah, so I can see what you're saying, but I I see God's hand not necessarily in war, but but in spite of it. Yeah, um, there's a lot of things, a lot of people that are lifted out of poverty or horrible things essentially because, you know, the U S decided to do absolutely horrible things to their government and other people, you know, sometimes God can use things like that to, to help other people and spread a lot of, you know, Christianity has been spread a lot of places because of war and yeah, it's not good. <laughs> There's no, always, there I mean, can always be, you know, a silver lining of like, Hey, a bigger picture might be, you know, that, this happens and we'll make the best of it. Right. So Stephen Rose, an Arco Christian podcast, he goes on, to, he says how he describes it is the ordination. The difference is that th it can be a tool. And so people will 
use this as a means to worship the tool. You know, it's this, this thing that we call like government or war or whatever. It exists before. I mean, it, it exists on its own. It can be used as a tool for a better purpose, but you don't worship the tool. And mm -hmm. uh, so, and another, like, for example, we talk about the, the ordination of kings or rulers or government officials and that they do God's will. And people take that as a literal interpretation. Well, what happens when war does break out between two governments? Is that God having like, a, you know, a conflicting thought or something? Does he? Yeah, like in, in World War One, you heard, you know, the Germans thought God was on their side, the Britain yeah. the same. And it's like, all right, well, who decides praying for help, you know? <laughs> God's on our side. It, well, I don't think that's very Christian at all to say. <laughs> no, it's not. I, I don't know. Do you guys know? Have you guys heard of the, um, what's it called? The War Prayer by Mark Twain? Uh, that he um, had published okay. posthumously. Yeah, exactly. It was written, or it was published after his death. Yeah, I, I, I think I. Yeah, I think I, I read about I that. I do not. No, okay. I've never heard of it. My Church of England school. <laughs> yeah, dude. If you guys, if you guys want to have something like really, like really, really eye opening, listen to that. You don't have to be a Christian. I mean, you. It, it's it's a really really great, and it's not a prayer. It's a little narrative. It's about a. It's about these churches. Um, let's see, was it before the Spanish-American War? I can't remember. But it was his take on these churches who were all praying for the guys on their side. And then an advocate for God speaks up in church and says, well, you realize what you're praying for. You're praying for the bombs to rip your boys apart. You're praying for your, your children to die in the trenches. You're praying for the children of other people to die in the trenches all for political gain. You know, it was yeah. <laughs> the Spanish American war was not a, a holy war by any means. <laughs> see, it's, it, I see this consistency with, uh, with this conversation where you have, um, you have people who kind of fall by the wayside and they misconstrue, um, you know, their, their faith and use it as an excuse for, Kind of selfish, you know, selfish political reasons what they mm -hmm. want to see happen to the world, and then you have those outliers, who I I hope to be more common than, you know, just the, the few that I've seen. But um, people who they they take a step back and they're like, well, this isn't um this isn't consistent at all, you know. And yeah, I, I see that very much. I mean, you know, you guys all are anarchist Christians in our community are kind of the modern outliers, and and of course you see it throughout history the the Christians who are anti-war, like you were just talking about, and but but yeah, you see these outliers who really make a point to be like, "Are we being hypocrites right now?" I I think we are, and we need to kind of take a step back and get with what the original message was. I'm thankful I exist. Yeah, the I mean, if you talk to a lot of guys like that, Stephen Rose is just one of them, and I'm one of them. Like. We see that form of Christianity that, I, I mean, I wouldn't call it Christianity. I'd just say it's like a false, some false teaching. Um, we see it as much as, as a threat as, you know, any other form of government. I mean, the fact that, like, you know, America is supposed to be a Christian nation. It, it claims to be a, and a lot of people would argue against that, but in reality, it is very much a Christian nation. It's, it's what is it supposed attempted, to be? It, I, well, here's the thing. It's not a Christian nation, but it claims to be a Christian nation. You yes, know? I agree yeah. with that. The, the worst kind. <laughs> yes, it is the absolute. It's taken a, you know, a what I would consider a wonderful faith, a very saving faith, and distorted it to be the worst thing that it could ever turn into. This is, you know, yeah. well, this way they, to control other people. A lot of them hate anything South. And there's so many Christians down south, it's ridiculous. Yeah. <laughs> Wait, yeah. <laughs> like, like, literally, like, oh, well, we were, we love Christians. And they're like, we're super Christian. And they're like, no. No, we don't like your kind of Christian. <laughs> <laughs> Bible Belt Christians. I'm in the south. <laughs> Would you would you consider yourself a Bible? But not, no, no, I'm talking south no. of the border, south. Oh, oh my gosh, 
yeah, I mean, there is like my brother in law, he's very devout Christian, com- like, comes from Mexico, and I mean, you'd be surprised just oh, how no, many no, just dude, how many like, guys down there. Are- no, I know what that is. What it's you're like saying. there the, are like the of... largest com- Christian community is South America. Latin America, yep, yeah, and a lot of Christians here don't yeah. like that. Yeah, I, I, I guess all that kind of Christians. Uh, well, it, it's it's it goes back to what we were saying at the start, where you know we have this window dressing of what our government stands for. I mean, we have you know America's a Christian country. America's a uh, land of the free it's a liberty it's a yeah you know, a, a liberty oriented nation and so we see politicians throw out those buzzwords that get certain you know um demographics of us excited like they throw out liberty and and freedom for all and you know all of us in the libertarian camp or the the newer ones at least or the ones who haven't come that far yet are like oh yeah i like those things that's my guy or they say you know i'm a, I'm a a uh, very Christian, very godly man, and then you know gets in office and he's trying to send our boys to the Middle East to go and fight. Uh, and it's like, well, I I don't think you guys know what those things you're advocating or or using mean. And um, that's I don't know. I, I keep on coming back to that point where it's all just window dressing for nefarious means, and everything's conflated and abused and neglected. Yeah. Well, I mean, did you? Like, have you guys, there's the, the whole Mike Pence thing here recently was saying that prayer about the flag. Did you guys, was it? Oh, God. Ha, has the RNC already happened? I can't remember if that's. Yes. I, I do my best I, to ignore I, 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 I do. <laughs> yeah, no, I don't pay any attention to I, politics. I, 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 saw, I just remember. I saw one little thing about it. And it went by so fast because the presidential candidates are such a mess. Yeah. So, but, so what's this? So it's like, it's something, I was in, whenever I saw this, I was in a, a hotel gym working out because I was, I was at a client's place for my job, and I was seeing late at night, I think it was the RNC, and Mike Pence was about to, you know, announce Trump coming onto stage and whatnot, and he was saying a prayer, Mm-hmm. And he was, oh. I'd, I'll, I'll have to pull this up on Google, but I seem to remember him saying, like, let us turn to the flag, that which yes. points us in the direction of morality or something like that. And then it's, <laughs> it, but if you look at it, like, his prayer Ooh. is scripturally based, but he takes out God and replaces Ooh. it with the flag. Yeah. That now. It's just this awful hybrid religion for the well, right. Well, no, no. What it is, it's like, it's the stereotype that's finally like, yeah, it's living up to all the memes. Seriously, yeah. I I just <laughs> I just pulled this up and it's I just pulled it up on well I mean it's Washington Post so you can believe what you want but it's <laughs> Pence altered biblical reference changing Jesus to the American flag in his convention speech. Ooh, yikes! Beautiful. Yeah. Well, I'm I mean... trying to look through the verse. So, okay, here's what the verse says. It's Second Corinthians three seventeen, and it says, "Where the spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom." The others is Hebrews twelve verses one and two. Um, the passage reads, "Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off every encumbrance and the sin that so easily entangles, and let us run with endurance the race set out for us. Let us fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of faith." who for joy set before him, endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. And what did he change? First, Pence substituted old glory for Jesus. He took a similar approach in the next line, inserting an additional, let's fix our eyes on this land of heroes and let our courage and their courage inspire before, before returning to the biblical text. He also describes Beautiful. Jesus, who he had replaced it with old glory, as the mm. author and perfecter of our faith and freedom, adding the words and freedom, which do not appear in the Hebrews passage. Mm-hmm. Oh my gosh, this gets worse than worse. Like, dude, dude, you, you know, know what? what? You know what? I give, an, I give an A plus to his fucking speechwriter. No, seriously, like, that was he some, was going that was some exactly really good stuff. for he knew he knows his fucking audience and he's 
nail yeah, it. Dude. Well, that, that's what Pence, Pence has always just been that symbolic gods in the White House kind of figure. Like, no, dude, he, you know, he seriously has. Guy, like, like Trump didn't yeah. give a shit the about the guy any I of that. work. The guy I work with <laughs> hates Trump, and he's like, "But if anything ever happened to Trump, Pence would be in charge." And he's like, "That's way worse. <laughs> it's worse." <laughs> and I'm um, like, "Yeah, maybe." Like, Let's try it. shock to the Let, cock, Pence. Let's try it. And then we'll get three new my, fucking my judges. Pence. <laughs> <laughs> what was it? Uh, uh, homo medicine from Thomas Edison, Pence. <laughs> <laughs> oh, what a horrifying dystopia that would be. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah. The gov- we, we'll just give the power of the, uh, to the government to fix your sexuality. <laughs> can't, can't I don't know where that would go wrong. That that oh, yeah. sounds like that sounds like a utopia to me if I've ever heard oh, one. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> God. Um. So I, I I mean we've we've done lots of ranting and and bitching about the evils of the state and how it's um twisted Christianity, but uh, I've got some questions regarding how that can be kind of turned around, and I think that'd be a, a kind of a nice way to start getting towards the end if you're cool with that. Sure. All right. So um. My first one I've got is, uh, how do we counter the evangelist Republican status culture surrounding most churches? Okay, I'd say, well, first off, it kind of depends on if you're a Christian or not, because my message is going to be I think this very different. Christian. Yeah, I, I think he's most, mostly saying, how do we get rid of like this kind of pro-war, pro-big government attitude that we, we see, you know, I'm Republican. I go to church on Sunday. It's like, all right, you're already inconsistent. Let's go. Right. So we're going to have to reveal <laughs> <laughs> scripture and the faith for what it really is and hard and come down on them hard. Like the sad thing is, is there's not a ton of us of Christians who are like this. A sad yeah. trend among Christ- Christians is that they do tend to be statist. And that is to me, that is just so horrifying and such a, a you know, sadness, but if we were to do it in any way, that'd be it. Um, I think that'd be the most fulfilling and meaningful way is to where there is deception and lies, you reveal the truth. Yep. Do you think Reb, you got anything um, on that? Yeah, I just, in my opinion, I think it comes down more to your personal relationship with Christ and your testimony of him. And if you focus on that and you help other people live that as consistently as they can and honestly in their soul as they can, I think they naturally will start to deviate from the ideas of, you know, politics and and religion are, are mixed or intertwined and, you know, they become more consistent on things like, no, I, I do abhor war no matter what. And I will do anything to make sure that my my sons, my, you know, my kids don't go into that. Yeah, I, I definitely agree with that. I think that it would mean a lot. It's Christians are called to be a light, right? A light in the lives. That's one of the things I, I hate so much about that right wing authoritarian stance is that mm-hmm. they... Their solution is politics, and then it drops. Yeah, I'll, I'll be the hammer in your life rather than a guiding yeah. light. And they want to punish <laughs> those that, you know. Not even them, it. though. Not yeah, even they, them. They, like, don't, they're, they, they don't want to do it. Punish. They'll elect they'll vote someone, for someone to do it. And then, and then their personal responsibility for seeing how society well, should develop well, they, in a righteous they elect, way just falls They elect off. the people that tell them they're going to uphold their Christian values. Mm-hmm. And they're like, well, my Christian values are you punish the shit out of that motherfucker. And he's like, yeah, I'm going to punish the shit out of that motherfucker. The state's going to profit. Yep. So there was, there was, uh, there's a right-wing authoritarian guy on YouTube called Nick Fuentes. And they like... Oh, that little they, shit. Yeah, they I they could drown post... him in a puddle and not be able to think. Sorry. <laughs> they, <laughs> they repost his stuff all the time. You'll see it all the time. And so one of those famous things is um, it's like a, vi- a video. It's got like, on YouTube on like a million views or something like that. It's a four-minute segment of one of his shows. And it says, it, the title is Nick Fuentes on porn. And he says, he talks about how horrendous porn is to our society, how it destroys and cripples. And then he says, we need to take an active, hard stance against 
pornography in the porn industry. So what we need to do is get government, get someone in government. And like <laughs> literally right there, he's just like, I'm going to take this active stance. So I'm going to be inactive to get what i want hands off as i can yeah exactly (laughs) not like i'm gonna be alive i voted and that i did my duty you know like so it's just like this huge like what we were talking about earlier a contradiction like it's it's just an unfounded regurgitated thing i love that about fascists that they'll say like this hurts and cripples society so you know what we need to do to fix society we'll hurt and cripple people and that goes (laughs) with the left too Dude, that's the that's the re- state of religion, <laughs> dude. Because they both converge right there. Well, I'm gonna do. I'm gonna go with the state. Always <laughs> yeah. like final answer. It, yeah, they, they have different reasons <laughs> yeah. why they agree with the state, but they're like, yeah, state, state. Yep. <laughs> yeah, I, I, but if like if you disagree with them, they say, well, what are you doing? You libertarians are doing nothing, right? <laughs> and then you're like. Well, I've literally well, that's how you, people, that's how you ignore yeah. something. <laughs> well, when you I, and, ignore it, it, like it doesn't exist. And in, in, in my opinion, it's just like be an active thing. Like show people, be a light to others, be an exemplary person, live a righteous life, show other people how to live righteously. You don't have to force it on them at the point yeah. of a gun. Like it's, the it's best like, thing that you could do to anybody is teach them, show them. Be the mm-hmm. like he's the the spirit of his message is to be an active solution to this, and then my he new, like. Sorry, go ahead. Oh, my new favorite thing is when I start working with a new guy. Like one of the first things I, I do is I tell him that I'm I'm an anarchist, and whatever they always have all kinds of fucking automatically judge me, and then I work with them for a little while. And I never bring it up again. And then, yeah. and then I'm like, "Yeah, I'm an anarchist." And they're like, "Well, what?" Uh, it, it makes them th- they're like, "Wait a second, this isn't the guy from the news." Yeah, like bombing people. He's an anarchist, <laughs> and he's like, he helped me clean my shit up and take my tools to my car. Yeah, I mean, they, you show them, like what you said, like. That's the best thing that anybody could ever do. That's going to be, I and honestly, you don't have to be a Christian if you show people how to be righteous, how to live a good life, be good to one another, not harm each other aggressively. You end up at this position, like you were saying, Rez. Like you show them that as a normal person, not hurting anybody. This is <laughs> like. Not hurting people, not taking people's shit, not being aggressive to people, that should be the natural state of humanity. Yeah. It's, the natural right. state of humanity should not be using politics to destroy each other to achieve a, a certain type of lifestyle. What kind of world does anybody want to live in <laughs> if that's their goal? The utopia. <laughs> It's just like these traditionalists as well who are like, you know, we, we need a, a strong state to reaffirm our traditions. It's like, well, your traditions don't sound very good if people aren't naturally, you know, practicing yeah. them. Like any, any a, a good tradition will stick around because it's popular and it's beneficial and it's, you know, good in, in some way. And so yeah. to think like if your traditions are so good, be consistent and practice them and show them why they're so good. And if they're not good, <laughs> they'll go away. And if they're, if they're great and as beneficial as you think they are, so beneficial, they need to be forced on us at gunpoint, um, people will naturally practice them anyway. Yeah, for sure. And, and that just, it, it kills me that that's, you know, th- this inactive, active solution where it's like, I'm going to vote for someone to do, <laughs> to, to enforce this for me because uh, I don't want to do it, but I want it to happen. It's, <laughs> I, I, it's this lazy instant gratification culture and and all these traditionalists and fascists think they're above it but they're they're the very same they want their society right now and they want to enforce at gunpoint so they don't have to make it happen well it's it's the advent of the politogram um you know that the this weird fringe <laughs> niche politics where you get government to support this really kind of creepy thing and (laughs) it's kind of come up in the last decade or so and you know i'm i post about traditionalism too like i am i am something of a a traditionalist but personally 
And I've tried to show people, like, tradi- the whole point about traditionalism is that it's supposed to withstand the test of time on its mm-hmm. own. And so, and then people say, well, if we don't enforce it, then tr- these g- degenerates are going to violate it. And then the response is, what, you're using violence against people to try to enforce your desired lifestyle. That is a degeneracy. Like yeah, a that's degeneracy. What they are doing to you, right? Like, yeah, that, a degeneracy doesn't have to be like some sexual immorality or, yeah. or so, something like that. Degeneracy is the falling into wrongdoing. Like, okay. You, okay. You, well, here's my thing. Here's my thing. <laughs> like, I like to consider myself a traditionalist, but most people wouldn't. My traditions aren't the same as yours. And when people start talking trying to label as traditions and if you don't follow my tradition then you're wrong am i i i don't do everything i don't follow every holiday that most people do like some holidays i like more like i go against tradition is tradition what we're looking for or are we just looking for people to be good people yeah that's what we're looking for people look to tradition because it may be good Mm. so like you try to look for the merit in tradition if there's a like i can tell you right now like at one point in time in in babylon there was a uh a tradition to sacrifice your firstborn child to the arms of molech who was a false god he he was like you had a statue (laughs) yeah you can see why you'd follow that i I see the appeal (laughs) i see the appeal the whole reason that that it cuts down the living cost a lot (laughs) <laughs> sorry a few, sorry, I few, a, a, a few mouths to feed a few less mouths <laughs> to feed right but like that was a tradition for a while it was a you know a, a horrendous tradition and the very fact that it died off should be a testament <laughs> to the lack of merit of that tradition it we being a tradition it <laughs> <laughs> yeah it uh, actually did not make the grass grow any faster the corn didn't stop getting wet during rainy seasons we were really so, convinced for about a 50 year period but but you yeah. had less people to pick that corn gosh <laughs> damn it this this you know this famine <laughs> won't let up our people won't stop starving time to kill off more of them demolic <laughs> <laughs> it's the only solution bring, bring us the healthy ones <laughs> <laughs> i like that <laughs> That will appease them finally. They don't like the sick ones. They say this while they're surrounded by their 14 child brides. <laughs> but do you guys have any ideas? No, I guess we're going with my idea again. Kill kids. Bunch of idiots. <laughs> but, you know, the, the whole point of tradition is it's supposed to be like the ones that you follow, the ones that you look to, kind of defeats the purpose if they're bad. So the traditions that survive the test of time, hopefully, are the good ones. And, I mean, it's kind of like a marketplace of ideas. If yeah, you, that's what if I you will. It's a free market of ideas. Yeah, for sure. It's like this whole thing, whenever, you know, a marketplace is really just a correspondence, a cooperation of, of humans <laughs> behaving yeah. freely whenever we're allowed to behave freely. And so ideas are much like products and services. and. They can change hands, how it costs at some, and the ones that don't have merit, that don't do anything for other people, they're going to die. Yeah. And so if they need artificial preservation, that should, be a pres- that, I mean, that should be a testament to the quality of that tradition. Right. Yeah. So, I mean, it, it, it's mm. the same. It's the same lane as good ideas don't require force. It's like I mean, yeah. if so, if something's worth keeping around, people will keep it around. You won't have to worry about it. You know. Yeah. Now I would say some traditions are worth like I'm not going to say enforcing, but upholding in your own life, like yeah. teaching to your kids for sure. But I don't think that's artificial. No. You no, know, no, no, no. a, a no. real tradition will give you a reason to spread them to, on in a legitimate basis. Yeah, yeah. Right? To be like, so, this yeah. is what we do, and if you want to join us for it, you know, come see what it's all about. That's Imagine how, how crappy it must be to, like, be a part of a tradition and realize that you are forcing your neighbor to do that same tradition. Like, is there any enjoyment out of watching, like, people <clears throat> be forced to do the same thing as you, even though you like yeah. it, you know? And so... Imagine all the dads that force their daughters, like, to marry eighty-year-old 
you know, True. sick pieces of crap. Like, how, like well, I, I was thinking like when Reb was saying your neighbor, like, well, maybe try to embrace their tradition. Maybe it could just turn out to be a cookout every year. And they're like, <laughs> hey, this is our tradition. We cook out. And you're like, well, I'm your neighbor. I don't follow your religion, but if you're having a cookout. Like, we can get along. Centrist grilling has entered the chat. <laughs> yeah, grilling. grilling. Start eating, realize it's a human leg. Oh, jeez. Like, oh, yeah. never mind. mind. <laughs> so I, I talked about getting dark towards the end. It seems Marauder has done that for us. Hello, I like human legs. <laughs> Cannibalism has entered the chat. I wasn't expecting that one this episode, but damn. <laughs> <laughs> you got any more questions? Oh yeah, I got, I got, I got plenty. Um, so, <laughs> you got one. You got one done. <laughs> yeah, yeah, one. yeah. I, I, it was a good, long, pleasing answer. Um, so some of these are a little bit. We, we can do like short answers if we don't want to get too deep. Okay, but, let um, me, sure. let me ask one. Uh, <laughs> All right. are, are you gonna start your own church? Uh, probably not. I mean, I might. I, I have people that I worship with that I. Um, spread a message with, but I. There's a lot of complexities. The the sad thing about churches nowadays is that, uh, uh, to be legitimate in a lot of ways, that you do have to cooperate with the state. Very okay. Very, the the state makes it a very tough thing to be, you know, away. Away from it. It's, and obviously, you guys probably know with jobs as well. The, the state well, well, requires... Well, here's where we can mix in the, uh, the agorism. Sure. <laughs> uh, let's call your Instagram a church. Yeah. Where you, where you preach. Yeah, for sure. People can come and listen. They don't have to. If they like it, they can stick around. So let's change the definition of what a church is. And just go with that. Fuck the government. <laughs> <laughs> Counter economics of churches. I like that a lot, actually. But I, I mean, no, you you make a very valid point. I mean, think how many people who have come from you know they they followed your page maybe for years because they enjoy you know seeing all the guns and stuff, and then um and, and then you start shifting into this kind of um, philosophical religious angle I, I, in addition to the guns and why it's all connected. That's something we need to touch on before we end the show. But um. <laughs> but uh but isn't that what a church is is just someone well, who wants yeah, to preach and people just show up is. and listen it's like yeah congregate congregation of believers yeah, yeah. Why, why do we have to involve government in this shit <laughs> we'll call it the church of the do. marauder project <laughs> i like it um i it's, i mean that's a i would i would love i am trying to do that i'm trying to do it as the to the best of my ability that is a prayer of mine I, I I really think um it's a yeah it, I I haven't even thought about it but it's a it is a decentralized church you know this message mm -hmm. is being put out and it's a, a lot of people are, are learning because so many would just grow up with their you know love of guns love of god and they think oh love of government goes right in the bag with that too and they just carry out this this life and this kind of misguided worship of sending the troops abroad and uh flag over coffin and. God, God approves this. God's on our side, and it's like uh, you're you're sending this message out there. That's I'm sure changed probably thousands of minds at this point. As long as you've been doing it, and with your following base, who've who've gone from this authoritarian Christian, if you could call it that, to uh, something a bit more consistent, a bit more mm -hmm. originalist, you know? Yeah, I sure hope that's the case. I sure hope it's the case that I, you know, I've I've brought a lot of people to that. That's that. Yeah, be the I best mean, thing even ever. for <laughs> guys like myself, like. I I have never, and this will this will hurt you to hear a little bit, but I've never enjoyed talking about the Bible. It's always been just a miserable conversation for me. Something I really, I'm like, I don't want to, yeah. I don't want to do this because it's not important to me. And so many of you are hypocritical. And so since I started, since I started yeah, seeing you stuff, I I'm genuinely very interested. Not you know, I, I don't think I'd ever be religious or a follower, but just. I, I'm glad you guys exist because right. I see I see a purpose for religion and, and faith again. And it, it works for some people. It's very important for some people and rightfully so. And and to see you and, and, and you know anarcho Christian Rebs to to see you guys and, and your followers go out there and put out a more consistent and just um 
I, I, I don't know, a more, a more Christian message than I've ever heard really before. It's, uh, it's been a great pleasure to see that. <laughs> On that, I'm just going to say agreed. <laughs> Oh, uh, thanks, guys. I really appreciate yeah, yeah. that. Just what I needed to hear. Sometimes it is. I do get. I, I mean, I'm sh- everybody does this. We get get discouraged, right? Sometimes it's harder to yeah. do than other yeah, days. Yeah, and I, I think um, what really does it for me, which I'm sure you've had messages about, you know, faith and politics. Um, people messaging me and be like, "Yeah, you you stopped me from joining the military, and I'm I'm going to trade school now." Or like, you you help me kind of reconcile this with this, and I don't know things make a bit more sense. I don't feel so alone now. I think you'll, you'll be reaching tons of people. And if there's any one amongst our following who hasn't heard of your, uh, your page yet, I think it'll mean a lot to them to find that community and to find that, you know, some sanity when they feel so... Because a lot of my questions were revolving around, you know, um, finding people with similar Christian beliefs to, to you guys who have removed that statist element. And, um, and so I, just knowing it, you know, it doesn't have to be in person. Just having that community on here can do a lot for people. Yeah, I sure hope so. But... Also agreed. <laughs> true. It's true. Um, so I. Well, I mean, it's. Oh no, no, no! Oh, go ahead. No, I was go just going to move on. No, I was just going to. Uh, I was going to add. Reb does a lot to it, especially here recently. Oh yeah. Well, and that's that's my thing, man. Is I ever since started this page to be more political, I wouldn't wasn't really gonna like dive into my religious beliefs at all until I realized how, first of all, like integrated they each are. Like the idea of non-aggression and my religious philosophy, you know, my religious beliefs match my philosophical ones, you know. And then just getting messages and talking to people who like I'm helping them through like a faith crisis or something, and it helps strengthen their faith, like. That just like makes my day more than talking politics, you know. It's just crazy. And so, and then that is one thing me and Br will never <laughs> experience. It's like it's super cool, you know. So I'm like, oh, maybe I will. No, that's crazy, dude. Off. Like, and then and you just get the into want a crusade. <laughs> well, <laughs> yeah, I, I'm I'm glad there's people out there uh, who who are finding you guys, and you know that they're getting that consistency, and they're moving away from the the violent shit <laughs> yeah i mean i mean and a lot of guys they see my stuff and they ask me if i'm a pacifist and which no i'm not a pacifist i'm a non-aggressionist obviously well no i'm a christian and by that i'm a non-aggressionist if people forget that christ purged the <laughs> temple with a whip uh mm-hmm. there's things worth fighting for in this world and we should fight for them, but not at the expense of innocent people. And we shouldn't use this aggressive form of vengeful violence, even against bad people, because it just erects bad for the sake of bad. And there has to be a difference. People have to see. And sometimes, you know, it gets to the point where I even look inwardly and I say, am I a pacifist or am I not? Which you know, if you've seen my collection <laughs> of firearms on Instagram, you know exactly. That would be a very a hard pacifist. question for most pacifists with a... that many guns. It'd be like, <laughs> what, where are we going? Dude, what, what do I moment. do with this? Do I sell them? But, yep. I but have that like, all the time. So. Yeah, seriously, it's, sometimes it's hard. But I think that's healthy. I think it's very healthy to have that internal dialogue. A, a declawed house cat <laughs> doesn't need to know that he will protect himself. Yeah. You know what well, I'm saying? He'll still go, dude. Uh, my buddy's dad had all a cat, all fucking declawed, would still take <laughs> out birds. Oh yeah, for sure. But like, that's to go on top of that point. Like, I've had to this this sense. Sometimes I'm like, I am so against violence. Am I a pacifist? You have to like something that I even tell myself. And like I said, this internal dialogue, the question as to whether I'm a pacifist or a non-aggressionist, that's healthy. You as a human being should have a healthy nature of rejecting pointless violence. So there's well, yeah, that. Yeah, no, but no, also- no. Po- pointless violence, but like you will protect your kin. Yeah, exactly. With, and- without like you will, you will protect your kin to the point where you will always try to get your kin away from violence ahead right. of time. Right. But so- if the if the circumstance happens. 
you are ready 100% yeah. to protect. And that goes, like, not just your kids, well, you know, I mean, your I mean, community to, uh, and to everything a, else. A consistent Christian, you know, kin is, you know, everyone's your uh, your brother and sister, you know? Everybody. So. Yeah. But there's there's also, on a philosophical level, that whenever I'm having these internal dialogues, I realize, and these things are, this is something that we have to argue with, or tell, not argue, tell to other people as well pacifism itself isn't peaceful like i know that's we we kind of blindly associate the definition the definition of pacifism with like peaceful but pacifism itself isn't peaceful it's harmless harmless isn't yeah. peaceful it's just lacking the capacity to do any form of violence peace means that you have the capacity to. to do violence but willfully choose to reserve it so, my argument is to be peaceful, to be consistent with this sort of thing, you have to know exactly what you're willing to fight to defend. So, that's, that's something that interests me. And dude, that's, that's animal instinct, dude. Like, yep. you know what you're going to fight to defend. And if you don't, well, that goes with Darwinism. You don't deserve <laughs> to exist. Like, if you want to fight for your own life, then sorry. For sure. And that kind of speaks about the whole vengeful thing that I mentioned earlier. It's mentioned in scripture and we kind of feel it a lot in our, like the non-aggression principle. It's inappropriate, unbecoming, immoral to do violence for the sake of vengeance. So vengeance, if you can't reciprocate violence afterwards as a form of punishment that we call vengeance, then that places so much emphasis on the ability to defend up front to prevent something from ever happening. If, if your two responses to aggression happening to you are defense or vengeful punishment afterwards, there is a, a difference between the two. Defense beforehand, the preemptive use of force to keep aggression from happening to you and to others, Versus vengeful punishment, the use of force and reci reciprocation for violence afterwards, which we know agorism and well, let's, you know, let's just... not let's not forget getting away from such things. Yeah, that's that's my point. Is like yeah, you sh you should not. It is unbecoming of you to use violence as a form of like overthrowing a tyrannical government because the action of doing so is likely to produce <laughs> another tyrannical yeah. government. So this thing comes full circle. You should not, it is unbe whether you're a Christian or not, it's morally unbecoming of you to use violence for vengeance purposes, which pr places all of the emphasis on defense. I, I guess, so my question um, I had was, how do you kind of, justify violence as a christian so i guess i guess you know all of that would come down to um only defensively whether it's you know on a micro or macro scale yeah yeah <laughs> kind, kind of like uh cart before horse and i was like all of that answers this question that i was about to ask so it, it worked out right um, so i have good, one good. kind of final one if you want to wrap up i don't know how you are sure. for time that no, I'm good, dude. All right. Maybe we'll do a couple then. But um, so I've, I've got a couple of real okay. solid ones that we can kind of nail. Um, so this one, how can I biblically explain anarchy and resistance to tyranny to my conservative relatives? Okay. So like I said beforehand, you have to be able to distinguish anarchy as a result of a moral principle and anarchy as the result of a political opinion. So a lot of guys would be like, I am an anarchist because I want to um, overthrow this, this violent tyrannical state. And like, because I hate the current government, that makes me an anarchist. You have to be able to distinguish this, that, from a moral philosophy. If you appeal to people with a moral philosophy, they're bound, to, they're bound to agree to you or to agree with you, and you have to be able to explain this moral philosophy as a point. That's how I, it, my stuff didn't start with Christianity. Yeah. 
I came to realize that, you know, whenever I was, if you were to look at it as a political square, a political compass, I think a lot of us probably started upper right quadrant, not up at the very top corner, but like somewhere in that upper right quadrant, no, you know, stereotypical do what? I was up there ways. Yeah. Okay. Me, mate. <laughs> well, I'm not trying to, not trying to, con- not, not trying to convict I, I myself more, of anything, but. I was more center and left. Yeah, you're an old one though. Anyway. <laughs> I am. I am. But like for, I mean, for a lot of us, like hard, strong and caps. I mean, at least I am. I know Stephen Rose of Anarcho Christian was similar like this, but start off up there. I came down somewhat for a libertarian stance, and whenever I started realizing like violence against innocent people is bad, and then whenever I realized, um, like all of government is based on is predicated on that, I hit bottom right. And with uh, more, more cultural and lifestyle choices, started moving over to the even more revolutionary anarcho cowboyism, <laughs> the new right bottom quadrant. And then when I realized what was calling of me, of my faith, I just dropped off the political compass, hit the bottom right corner, and dropped off. <laughs> Went the missing, and altogether. we just leave him alone and, now. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but like these are they're, they're political, you know, political stances but their moral values. And at some level, most people are going to agree with them, see them as legitimate, and you have to be able to explain these things. Like, yo, dad, do you think it's okay to um, use, you know, violence against innocent people? Well, of course not, son. Now explain to him why anarchy is a philosophy, a moral, not a political philosophy, a moral philosophy of peace. If you're a Christian, explain to him why Christianity opposes the use, the governmental use of, you know, terror and violence against innocent people. So, I mean, that's, it's got to be the moral yeah. philosophy. If you try to appeal to other people, politics divides yeah, people. Yeah, absolutely. It, I mean, it really does. We're, there's a reason that we are anti-political or we're supposed to be. It's because politics, we've... We, I think a lot of us realize that this, this thing that we call politics is so incredibly political. Or I'm sorry, it's so incredibly decisive, divisive, and it's, that's what tribalism yeah. is, right? It's, we, people say tribalism is unifying. It's not. It's really yeah, divisive. Right. I'm red, and you're so, blue. We don't, we don't meet in the it, middle. You're from the, the enemy tribe. Right. And so if you try to appeal to someone with this form of politics, it's never going to work out. Not really. And the only way a, pol- a political standpoint would ever work out is if on some level you appeal to them from a moral basis. So I say, cut to the chase, just go with a moral basis. Explain to them why those views are wrong and why these views of non-aggression are correct. I've, I've never viewed it through quite such a, a clear lens, but no, that really, that's, that's what I've been doing. Like even just, um, I mean, the literal last episode I recorded, talking to my girlfriend about politics like when we talk about politics we mentioned it in the valentine's episode too when you talk about politics with someone and you're trying to build like maybe a romantic relationship with them and you drop a label like democrat republican libertarian or something more extreme you know and cap and calm all this it just puts you in a nice little tribe and we can say i don't like those people and you know conversation is shut down but when you come from the you know shared yeah. morals like i think this is wrong rather than putting a label like I am this, so I think all of these things are wrong. You can actually have conversation. Yeah. So, yeah, like, going off of that, don't, don't legitimize the ad hominem attack. Like, a lot of these people re- will reject you, ba- not based on your argument, but based on your yeah. identification, who you are as a person, that name that you attribute to yourself, the politics. And so whenever we start like identifying ourselves as certain things, certain isms, we're legitimizing that ad hominem effect. We're giving clarity and merit to their argument that, well, their attack on you as a person has some foundation because you yourself obviously identify, you yourself obviously have placed value in that title. So why not attack it? Yeah. Right. So don't don't give them that. 
don't give them that stance. And it, more than just for the argument, realize that it doesn't suit you. It doesn't do you any good to just blindly subscribe to this yeah, ism. Playing in an arena that we're trying to get and, rid of altogether. Yeah. Right. Right, exactly. Don't, don't legitimize that ad hominem. Stand for what's right. You know where you'll end up if you stand for what's right. Show them why it's right. I, I really love that. I've, yeah, c coming at it from, well, my politics are more moral than yours is like, okay, well, let's get into a political fight instead of a, <laughs> let's get into like very basic yeah. humanist principles of what's right and wrong. We can get so blinded by these labels. Yeah, that's. Yeah, so that's why one of the reasons I said, it, I don't want to piss anybody off again but like the agorism is a political thing i don't like i know it's a rejection yeah. of politics but whenever we uh, come to it in this arena and you were to say to someone i'm an agorist their immediate snap judgment is oh that's a form of politics because you've entered into the political yeah. arena now calling yourself an agorist is fine we all all in this group know exactly what agorism is the subversion of violence essentially of blind, well, I don't like to be labeled at all. That's good. Like I honestly, like, like I, I relate most with anarchists, but like, it don't label me, dude. Like, don't don't add this, this, is who, this is who I am. Right, you I agree. See for I like that. That's good. I I mean I agree. Like your like your why, message. Do, why is everything got to be labeled? What the fuck is <laughs> well, that? For sure, your Why is your message will be valued. This little perfect fucking it's, it's thing for you. Like I'm just me. I'm just me. Yeah, it, you know me. Considered. Like, like I'm 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 obnoxious <laughs> as fuck. Like hey, you know that, and you'll answer my calls. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Most likely not at all. Um, <laughs> yeah, that happens. <laughs> but um, shit. No, like it, it's something I consider a lot because I think everyone in this community we. You know, we, we, we try and be teachers to the best of our ability. And so, unfortunately, we succumb to having to use labels because it's the quickest way to teach. Even though you're trying to move beyond that, it's like a step to educating. It's like, I have to slap these labels on a few things. So we're not talking about, you know, fairy yeah. dust. It's like, let's establish these groups as these things, which is a bit collectivist. But in the long term, you'll get what I mean. Yeah. <laughs> it's a silly fucking process, yeah, but it's essential. Yeah. You know, what I've found a lot in these arguments that I've had to have online is that whenever I have these moral views, and we all share these, right? These things that we call anarchism, liberty, agorism, whatever. And so we know they're predicated on a moral view. Then we go with the name, right? And then we try to argue it to other people. Well, the issue is, is that oftentimes, more often than not, you get into arguments, debates, whether it be with a super left wing or a super right wing, not over the moral question, but over how you define something, right? So a lot of times this, this argument that we yeah. have is, yeah. oh, that's not real anarchy, <laughs> or that's not real socialism, or that's not real fascism. This blah, 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 blah is what that real ism is, and then the argument ensues of what <laughs> is real and what is not. As opposed to the underlying moral philosophy. Yeah. What is righteous? If some, like, if you put this out there, I promise you, what is morally righteous will be self-evident. Some people are, you know, some people ha don't really have a mind for that sort of thing. But often enough, if you point out moral arguments, it will yeah. come clear. I mean, I mean, we get so much justification, right? like... so. Uh, just as you were saying, that's not real socialism. It's like, okay, but it was an attempt at it, and a lot of people died. So how about we view the the moral reasoning and, and, and how it all came to be rather than what we're going to, the label we're going to slap on it. Right, right. So if, for example, like if you're arguing about socialism versus capitalism, it's not good enough and probably not even ideal to argue about what is socialism and what is capitalism. The fact that if someone is coming from a stance where they're ag arguing for socialism, it kind of shows that the term itself, it's not really that what's orienting their argument. What's orienting their argument is the fact that they value socialism yeah. itself. So you have to describe, like, 
Well, I'm, I'm not going to argue with what these isms are. What I'm going to tell you is it's morally wrong to take people's property with the threat of violence. Yeah. Now, imagine having to claw your way back from that. Yeah, it, it's having to try to explain to someone, no, it's okay if I literally use the point of a gun to take your property. Almost never can be done. And I'd say, you know, I mean, personally, I don't think it could ever be done. I don't think most people have the, you know, the brain capacity to argue in any formi- formidable way of why <laughs> that could be a righteous thing. So it, logically would come to the point of why not just bring that up in the onset as opposed to arguing about the isms yeah there's much better ways to like really get to the meat of philosophy and debate and (laughs) cutting out that that silly definition is getting right to the moral justification for everything any of us you know all four quadrants would um argue for is is how you really get to what's important and so many people skip that these days and it's awful Right. Politics is honestly, at the end of the day, how a lot of people, I mean, it's, I mean, we, we know it's trying to use force to control people, but a lot of the intention behind it is how to control ethics. It's an argument, not of what's good, but how to control what is good. If you can point out to them what is and what isn't good, as opposed to arguing the method to control good, and by goods, I mean, what is morally righteous, then you've won the battle. If you can show a socialist that instead of arguing about their ism, that their view is morally wrong, you've won the battle. Yeah. And the same thing with a right winger, like a far right winger. Yeah, I mean, I mean, somebody get woken up when they realize, you know, oh, what freedom and all that has come to mean. It's like you can you can slap any window dressing you like on it, but when you when you look at what's really happening and the real moral outcome of sending young boys to war and shit. It's like, mm, are we in the right? Is it worth it? Yep. Um, I agree. So something I'd, I'd like to wrap up with, because we've mentioned guns maybe three or four times over like two hours. Seems an awful shame on an episode with, with you on, my friend. So um, <laughs> what I'd like to dig into as a, as a final topic would be um, civilian rifleman culture, which is something like whenever... Whenever one of us posts something, you'll we'll usually share it and have like a little back and forth about it or something, because it's something that I really enjoy seeing in this community, um, kind of being revived. The the whole, you know, you don't need to be some, uh, you know, Iraq Afghanistan vet to to know a thing or two about moving a rifle and you know small unit tactics and all that good stuff that should be ingrained in American culture. Um, you know, it should have been consistently ingrained in american culture since the you know, the revolution um so yeah how, what, what do you make of the terms uh civilian rifleman um i mean it's very much desired in my opinion uh like <laughs> i think that i i don't want to describe what should be as a warrior culture because i feel like a warrior is someone who takes occupation in war which I'm yeah. morally against. <clears throat> but a civilian rifleman is more or less in a morally um, you know, ambiguous term. Uh, I'd say it's... I think you have civic duties as opposed... It, like when it comes to... And when I say civil, civic duties, I don't mean what you're owed to government. I mean what morally your relationship with other people in society. Um, I think you and I and everybody else are called to by morality to defend what is good to the best of our ability. Um, I feel like the reliance on some sort of authority. Oh my God. Holy hell. <laughs> you all right there, mate? <laughs> my case of beer busted out. Did, did you accidentally uh, swallow all, all of it? All the beers went all, all over, all over. Oh my God. That's the worst crash I've ever heard on this show. Um, all right. So, but where the hell were we? Oh, so, so uh, <laughs> I think I can recover. Uh, Makes one of them. So, uh, I think you and I have the moral duty to defend what's right here. 
in this country, in the world, right? And to rely on some sort of authority or provider for the defense of what is right is, yeah. well, it's wrong. And it, it's not us. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's what boils down to it. It's, yeah, so the civilian rifleman really is, is just an acceptance of that we are morally obliged required i wouldn't say required i don't want it to be a law or anything but from a moral standpoint we ought to defend like i said we in in the absence of doing vengeance against evildoers the emphasis is put on the defense and the society that would be best defended from uh, evildoers is the one in which every single person knows how to is competent with rifle systems, other weapon systems. I'd like to see you know professional grade military mi- military like forces amongst civilians. I know civilians who personally do that. You can call them a militia or whatever. They probably don't call themselves that, but uh, yeah, I mean, there's there are people, there are civilians. I'm one of them who accept this idea that the government should not have a monopoly mm-hmm. on defense. This idea that if you put on a plate carrier and a war belt and boots and some military style combat pattern to disguise yourself, conceal yourself in natural terrain, that you're some sort of LARPer. That's not true. That's you know, shitty government propaganda to try to yeah. fool you you're not as from real accepting as, the as responsibility of defense yep. from yourself. Right, exactly. This monopoly that they have on it is fake. It is fake. And it sh- everybody should reject it. You can't, you can't hold this thing up that we call like righteous self-defense and at the same time say that civilians ought not to have the capability to defend themselves in a yeah, militaristic like, stomach. Is, is, is every guy be. carrying a or every every person carrying a gun on them, like a laughing as a cop, because we should we should just have cops defend us. It's it, it's the same thought process. It really is, and you know, inevitably, <laughs> I'd say that a lot of to to do with the military is, you know, very immoral. Oh, yeah. Like the the conflicts that they go into is immoral, and the fact that. We demonize people who try to be better in our defensive capabilities than that. We can is... say it's almost totally immoral. Well, yeah, well, right? Yeah, what, the military like, existing? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes, yeah, yeah. so I, oh, I, I, I do yeah. agree, but like... Oh, sorry, go on. No, what no, I was going to no, say was, no, like, no. I think anyone who... You know, I, I keep on ragging on them, but the, the kind of evangelical right who... Who view, uh, you know, e- even minicus who are like, well, we need to at least have our military and our police and stuff. And it's like, well, I-, I mean, just the very existence of them requires, you know, theft, which is immoral, and it's just this massive bloated system of of waste and abuse and stuff that's clearly not for the people. Whereas if we if we were right. to adopt those kind of more Anglo-Saxon values of, you know, the carpenter. Yeah, he, he carries a knife for his day job, but he can also wield, wield a sword well, and a bow. We, we have a military. We have a military that's like not even allowed to be in our borders. Like technically, yeah, that's a good point. I mean, it just shows how like how so they're not really oriented for the. Yeah, like our military is the National Guard, and we all know how much of a joke <laughs> that is. So. Yeah, the- like if it was really about just protecting yourself and not invading other people, your military would be here to protect the people. <laughs> not three thousand miles away in a desert. <laughs> Looking for our freedom they still haven't cave. Found them. Every vet I bring on here tells me they haven't found them yet. I'm getting fucking sick of us not finding them yet. What are we doing? <laughs> uh, what are we paying them for? But Oh, uh, we gave that up. <laughs> we, we just never we're doing doing COVID uh, now. We're, we're doing <laughs> viruses now. Uh, but um, but yeah, but yeah. Oh, uh, I was Sorry, just gonna wrap up with with that and say like um, I mean the most moral thing if if you truly think um, 
you, you know, those things are essential is for the people to do it and, and for the people to have responsibility over themselves and to, you know, cut out all the the needless violence and the needless waste and the needless right. theft and all this immoral stuff that comes with these systems and just go back to, you know, a, a more traditional way of, of living, which is, you know, we self-police and the people um, just naturally out of, uh, you know, just in case every every community can assemble and defend themselves and defend what's theirs and their property and they don't owe that to any you know higher governmental power you know they they defend themselves out of necessity and that's where it ends right so if war is the health (laughs) of the state right you've Mm. heard that a lot then righteous self-defense is the preservation of the people and the detriment of state violence because the second you take responsibility for yourself I mean, they can't, that's not one of those shiny things we were talking about. They can dangle in front of you. It's like, we defend, it's like, no, we can defend ourselves. Yep. Thank you. Okay. I've said this many times on my page, but the reason that the state can hold itself over so many people is because it's a convenient mm-hmm. middleman, albeit often a very crappy yeah, middleman. You have to think like, about it. The services it provides are absolutely horrible, but like it is a convenient middleman. Um, you, I put these posts out, and you see in the comment section, um, guys will say, well, like, how do I defend our, my community from, like, riots or stuff like that? Um, well, I mean, you can do it literally in the same way they do it, just, like, not with them. The fact that you think, <laughs> I mean, at the very least, you can mimic them. You and your buddies can mimic what they do, you know, from a defensive perspective and achieve the same result or you know you can contract employ people to do it the it, the possibilities don't begin and end with someone with a badge telling you this is how it's done um the a convenient thing for the government and the military is that it's been along it's been around so long that well people have forgotten how to act without <laughs> yeah, it it's, it's just like that a libertarian saying of you give it, you know, three or four generations of the government teaching our kids how to walk and they'd it'd make funny if you're thinking you could do it on your own, but <laughs> except subtract like, by like a like thousand two, years. Like two generations. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. And how quickly we outsource our responsibility. I mean, how 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 fast did it <laughs> yeah. I, like there's still privately owned country roads in the you know, in the county that I live in, but people without a doubt here will still say, well, if it wasn't for a government, hmm. roads wouldn't exist. <laughs> you know, the, it just, there's, there, in my capital city, it's kind of like a urbanization is relatively new in the state where I live in. And so people still remember when this very large road that exists now was a gravel hmm. road at one time. And it was like maybe 50 years ago or something like that. And, you know, people still question, people still say, like, with government, we get paved roads. That's the only way. <laughs> well, <laughs> no, I mean, roads exist. <laughs> you know, it's just it's that monopoly, that convenient middleman and the presence of time and reliance and no self-dependence or independence that people end up yeah. like this. Man, that's I, I don't think it's a dark end, but it's a it's a. It's an honest end, you know, like um, unsettling. Yeah, it, it's it's the way things are going, and there needs to be a a change in so many different facets of life because there's so many different so many different ways we're kind of dominated, and um, whether it's you know religion or um, defense or any of these things that we think we can't do for ourselves because we've been conditioned to think that um, it, it's just something that they're you know, you can be as anarchist as you want, but if you think there's no solution to it outside of the state, they're still controlling you. If you still have these doubts, um, they're, they're in control of you. Oh, and my fire alarm's going off. That's good. It was a busy night oh in BR's household. <laughs> well, guys, I'm probably about to have to get off here. That sounds good. Um, anything else you want to say before we uh, plug you? Well, um, I hope... <laughs> I hope everybody chooses peace. I hope everybody chooses what's right. That's a wholesome thought. And and me me too. I think um 
I think a lot of people are getting sick of the violence and the chaos. I think, I think after this year, hope I I hope to God, with with how just manic it's been for a year straight, people are gonna be like, I just want to chill the fuck out, and I want my my lifestyle to reflect that. I I'm an optimist, so maybe I'm being hope too hopeful, but we'll see. I I think if we keep on spreading our message as far and wide as we can, and the the pragmatic moral argument for peace and all that, we'll we'll start to reach more people because there's going to be more receptive ears, more and more. I think as things get crazier and crazier. Yeah, there always must be hope. That's why we do it, right? Yeah, the whole Absolutely. point. Absolutely. I, I I I people people ask me all the time, like, are you an optimist? And it's like I'd have to be, otherwise I wouldn't run this space. Yeah. Like, I, it might sound doomery sometimes, but. I do this because I think there's a hope to educate enough people to make a difference. For sure. And the fact that, I mean, several of us have like 20k plus, it, it gives me hope. There's, there's receptive ears out there and they go on and plenty of pages that, you know, had a, a, like 15 followers when they started messaging me now are like, you know, 5,000. The ideas spread. Yeah. And it's, it, it just keeps on growing and growing. Let's see where we're at in five years or maybe a decade. Absolutely. We'll see where we're at. I mean, yeah, just look at, you know, Whiskey, Babylon, all these other pages on Twitter, you know, Sal. My God, the amount of reach they have yeah. after just, you know, I'd like to, less than 10 I'd years. like to plug anti-state. Dude is freaking amazing. Sends me stuff all oh. the time. Guys, if you're listening to this, go check out anti-state. Literally just like at anti-state on Instagram. He is a great dude. <laughs> anti-state. Come on our podcast. <laughs> Please. Okay. Like, come on. Like, we, we how long like we got to work this out? Now. We, Bring we love you, bud. We'll, we'll figure we'll, we'll, it. We're in negotiations. He, um, no, it, it'll it'll happen soon. <laughs> Please, come on. <laughs> <laughs> Someone send this motherfucker some M&M's Yo, or your something. Call. <laughs> um all right where, where can we find you is it just uh just the instagram page or are you anywhere else these days? i mean i like there i think there's a facebook page and a twitter page but i haven't posted there in like literally years so so <laughs> if you if you get on instagram look up at the marauder project and you'll get my page it, you might find me at the bottom because of shadow ban but <laughs> i've noticed that that's always fun. like I oh I also run the page things. Armed Naturalism, which is yes, yeah so it's Armed Period Naturalism, and that page is specifically dedicated to like environmental, um, like outdoor stuff. So that one's I that's another project. I don't have a ton of time for it all the time because of like just photo editing and stuff like that. And it involves, I don't know if you've seen it, but it's a submission based yeah. one. It's not all of my stuff. So a bunch of people just send in pictures of them in kit, um, like in combat kit out in the wild. So it involves like a lot of messaging and it just takes a bit of time, but I'm trying to get that thing off the ground too. I love it. It's, um, it, it's nice that it's, it's such a simple thing, but it's inspiring people to actually go out and do what so many of us, you know, we always talk about going out and kit and, you know, and put, getting some training and getting some hikes in and all that stuff. And picking up your we, gosh we're like, dang trash. Golly. Yeah. yeah more, more of that. Too. Yeah. I mean, if we're going to talk about, you know, there's all this, Oh, well, what about libertarians in the environment? Just start cleaning up shit. Just be the change you want to see in, in all facets of life. Yeah. Be um, the light, you know, I love it. Well, thanks for coming on, man. I mean, we'll, we're definitely going to have to have you back for some more stuff. Oh, hey, sure. man, thanks Otherwise. a lot for coming on. Thanks, Rez. It's... I appreciate it, buddy. Thank you, guys. <laughs> all right. uh, I've been looking forward to this one yeah. for a while, so it's, it's good to get it all in the books. Thanks, and buddy. I really appreciate it, buddy. It's been a good talk. Yeah. All right. Thanks for listening, everyone. And we'll see you next time. This is the part where someone says something dumb. And Fuck you, Greg. Leaving... Yeah, there it is. <laughs> <laughs> I'm deciding if I'm leaving it or not. <laughs>